So Tana Koto Katoa. Another fortnight has flown by and we find ourselves once again at Webinar Wednesday. This evening we are fortunate to be joined by Rachel Hall. Rachel works as a nurse practitioner in cardiology for Bay of Plenty District Health Board and also runs clinics in Te Puke, linked with PHOs delivering Haora services. Rachel has been involved with cardiac rehabilitation for a number of years. She has also chaired the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand Rehab Committee and been a representative on the International Committee of Cardiac Rehabilitation. Rachel has taught a postgraduate cardiology paper for several years. At the moment, the majority of her workload is providing heart failure clinics and helping patients reach optimal health. Additionally, Rachel is involved with Adult Congenital Heart Services Transitional Clinic and the monitoring of patients with various pacing devices. Tonight, Rachel's presentation is on heart failure and cardiac medications, including types of heart failure, medications and therapies. Very interesting. And I shall now hand you over to Rachel for this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Welcome, everyone. Uh, yes, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions either as we go, in which case Cathy will interrupt me, or at the end there will be a chance for questions. Because myself, I often find it's those question and answer times that are the most useful for us in our clinical work, because that's when the rubber meets the road and everyone's had the same kind of problems. So tonight we're going to start by looking briefly at the symptoms of heart failure, just look at the various ways we describe it. I'll talk about ejection fractions to do with the echo, beta-type natriuretic peptides, uh, fluid management, medications, and some devices that we use in heart failure, which is becoming more and more common. Okay, so this is a, um, a description of heart failure from the Australian and New Zealand guidelines. So they come out in 2018. And it's basically a, cl a complex clinical syndrome. In cardiology, we think of heart failure perhaps a little bit different to how it's thought of in primary health. In cardiology, we like to have the echo. We like to see where the problem lies. Whereas in um, general practice, there's often that person that you think possibly has heart failure. They have the common signs, they're short of breath, they're a bit puffy, they had a heart attack a few years ago. So there are the typical signs and symptoms that we make, can make that diagnosis of. And essentially it's a problem with either filling with blood or ejecting the blood from the heart in order to keep the body working well. So common conditions that cause heart failure, they are ones to do with the muscle itself, such as post heart attacks, toxic damage. So I see quite a few people that are getting chemotherapy, um, often particularly the Herceptins and things that can damage the myocardium and they'll come to me to get up titrated until we can get an echo where the EF goes back over 35, then they can have some more chemo. Um, the abnormal loading conditions, particularly the hypertension and the arrhythmias. So this is your fast AF or your SVTs. And they are the joy, really, because tachycardia heart failure, once you control the heart rate, the heart just recovers, um, particularly if they're on the right medication, you know, they, they bounce back. The reason that I put this slide in here is if we don't fix the cause, then we might get them better symptom-wise, but it's going to return. Like the metabolic, um, if the thyroid is out and the hypothyroid, then you're going to get that fast tachycardias and drive them back into some heart failure. So you really want to decide how they got there because then you can turn it around. Of course, IHD is always the hardest one because often it's scar muscle. But I do try and encourage patients that even though we see the areas on the echo that aren't working well, we don't see everything. Just like when we look at arteries, we can see the ones that are blocked, but we don't see all the little ones that are feeding into that tissue. 
and helping to keep it alive and happy to return to good function. When we are deciding what medications to give, often we're asked for NYHA. So this is the New York Heart Association Heart Failure Classification, and it's quite intriguing. A lot of people I've taught over the years haven't noticed this, whereas it's in every person's notes that has heart failure. And so it's just a way of describing how much impact it has on their daily life. So if they were a basketball player at class one, they can still play basketball, race around the court, and they're not troubled at all. They might still have heart failure, but they have great quality of life. If they start having limitations and they'd rather hang out down the back of the court and not race around so much, then that's when it's the class two. Class three is when they are more interested in being the coach. And class four is probably when they'd rather watch the game on TV. And of course, that becomes a bit hard to decide when you've got a little old lady that doesn't do much in her day. She might cook her meals and look after her cat and go out to a bridge club, but she's not putting a lot of exertion on her life. So it can become a bit tricky and you some have to, sometimes have to be a bit interrogative on in what questions you ask to see if it is actually affecting them. Because they'll say, oh no, they're fine. But what happens is they accommodate and they might go for a 10 minute walk, but that walk is slowed down. Um, so often I will get my patients to have a regular walk every day and see how far they can go in that 15 minutes know how long it takes them to walk that block because then if it starts taking them less time then they're improving if it's taking them more time then that's the time when they need to uh, think what else is going on so when we think about the common signs and symptoms often people get really caught up on weight but it's actually one of the less specific signs because I know that my weight can fluctuate a kilo from day to day for no good reason. And if it's birthday season or Christmas season, then of course, or winter, <laughs> then of course that increases. Whereas the typical ones are the dyspnea, the, the shortness of breath. Because if you think about where it backflows to, then if the left heart is affected, then it backflows to the lungs. So you're going to get those breathing problems straight off. And, you know, having to, if people have to sit up in bed at night, to me, that's an old dear sign, you know, you're in problems. And I love this one down the bottom, bendopnea. That came up to being a few years ago. And I asked my patients if they can bend over and tie up their shoelaces without getting short of breath. And often they look at me and say, oh, how did you know? And it's as they get that fluid around their liver that liver roll, that they notice that as they bend over, they can no longer breathe well. So that's quite handy because not everyone holds fluid down their ankles where we traditionally looked. Sometimes it is around the abdo. And I had a lady not so long ago whose whole face was expanded. Other people notice it, their rings get tightened. So everyone presents slightly differently. Of course, the more specific signs are the JVP, which can take some practice to get used to seeing. And essentially, the JVP is a duck inwards, whereas if you're looking for the carotid pulse, it's going to come out. So the JVP is an inwards, and the hepatojugular is where you place your hand in your upper abdo and kind of force that liver area up, and you'll see the JVP rise. And the third heart sound is the lubductor, lubductor, and the laterally displaced apex. So if you've got a big heart, usually the apex beat is kind of mid-clavicular line. If people have a large heart, it's going to move outwards. So those are your typical signs and symptoms. What we really like for diagnosis is, a, is we really want to have an echo. And in the echo, we're all concerned about ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is the amount of, the percentage of blood that is squeezed out in each pump. It's never going to be 100. 
And I often don't tell patients what their EF is because otherwise it's really alarming. If I say, oh, you're good, it's 40%. Hang, 40% doesn't sound like a pass mark to me. So I generally don't mention EFs unless I've met with a person a few times and they haven't got their ears on and they're not doing what I've asked and we're not making progress. Then I'll start telling them how bad it really is. But essentially in heart failure clinic, you come to see me if your EF is less than 35%. So it's a diagnosis of systolic heart failure with a diagnosis of less than 40%. In diastolic heart failure or HIF-PEF, the ejection fraction is normal and we'll come to that soon. So in the, in the normal heart failure that we look at in cardiology, it's less than 40%. So if you look down in that center um, one there, it's in systole, which I can't see on the top of my screen is covered. Um, in systolic heart failure, you've got these enlarged ventricles. So they fill up with blood really well, but when it comes to squeezing, they haven't got the squeezing power. Whereas if you look on the left side of the screen, the ventricles fill with blood and then in systole, vroom, you've got some nice muscles there to squeeze out, hopefully about 60% of the blood. But in that centre one, the ventricles are pumping out less than 40%. When it's a 40 to 50, it's kind of that midline. There are various international um, conversations about how we treat them, but um, I'll just concentrate on the under 40s today. So that's the systolic, which is the squeezing problem. So that reflects the prevalence of ischemic heart disease. Um, with that, we often get some mitral regurg because often the LV is a bit dilated. And essentially, it's a squeezing problem. And if you look at international uh, research, it's always called HIF-REF. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HIF-REF. So the other kind of heart failure is the diastolic. And you can see on that right line that the stiff ventricles are not going to fill with blood. They don't relax enough to get a good volume in. When it comes to squeezing, they can squeeze really well, but they didn't have enough mills in there in the first place. So when we look at ejection fraction, they're still squeezing out over 50% of what they had in there but they didn't have much in there to start with. So they will still get some of the same signs that we get with systolic, but it's a filling problem. What's the problem with that? Well, see down the bottom, there is no recognized treatment. So when we come to the medications later, I'm talking purely about HIF-REF. Diastolic dysfunction where it doesn't relax or heart failure with pre preserved ejection fraction, so HIF-PEF, there is no recognized treatment. They've tried various things for a while. It looked like spironolactone might help. It looked like um, duride might help, but nothing helps. You basically just uh, use furosemide if they're overloaded. If they're hypertensive, you use ACEs. You, you treat the need. Um, but the good thing is that there's lower rates of mortality. So I have seen some patients who have had significant HIF-PEF. When I saw them, I can think of one offhand eight years ago, and she's still going strong. So lower rates of mortality, and actually in a recent echo, hers had improved. So goodness knows why, but we have controlled her hypertension and done everything else like that. So she's going well, but it is more common because of the elderly. You get those fibrotic changes, and particularly if they've had hyperglycemia for a while, they've got that um, just fibrotic changes, and so they're no longer relaxing. So diastolic, mm, but it's the way of the future. It's growing and growing. This is from um, the European guidelines. So European guidelines are what we tend to follow in New Zealand. They're a bit more aggressive than the American guidelines. And the European conference is in two weeks, and they're going to release the new guidelines then. So coming down this centre, 
with your initial assessment, if your diagnosis is un uncertain, then you need an echocardiogram. Oh, yeah, we can all get echoes. <laughs> Usually there's an 18 month wait for them. If you can't get an echo, then that's where a serum BNP does wonders. And if that BNP is below the threshold, then you start looking at other reasons. You know, do they need a spirometry? Is it a COPD? If the BNP does show up, then that's when you need to refer in for echo. And then um, once we've got an echo, we come down oh, to the... So if we go on to diagnostic investigations, sorry, that little mouse pad's a bit trigger happy. So we would always do echoes. And the next good thing is a chest X-ray, because if you've got a huge heart, even though the patient might be well, you know that at some stage they're not going to be well. Um, an ECG, what's normal in heart failure? Well, it's the abnormal. If they've got a normal ECG, they're not usually in heart failure. I have some patients with normal, and that's quite exciting. But you usually you see the, the tall QRSs, which is the sign of hypertrophy. You have the AF, you have the bundle branch blocks, you have the, all kinds of blocks. We would always do the basic bloods because we can never get away from iron studies and thyroid and all those other basic things. Listening to the heart is wonderful. Um, I wish I was even better at it. You know, there's so much in life to learn. And it's always handy to listen to the lung sounds as well. So B and P are the GP's friend. I use them occasionally when I am puzzled by a patient, even though I've been working in heart failure for years, every patient is different. And I had a lady recently who um, I saw her in the clinic waiting room. She was waiting to get an ICD check and I discharged her a couple of years ago. I don't hang on to them once I've got them up titrated. And I said, oh, are you okay? And she said, oh yes, I'm just here for my ICD. And I didn't think she was quite right. So I got her in to have a look at her. And she's a goer. She wears a pedometer to work. She does 22,000 steps in a day and she has to go up and down flights of stairs. When I first met her, her EF was 9%. Do you see the problem with that? Her EF now is about 26%. So on this day, I thought, mm, you say you're okay, but I know you have a really high tolerance of unwellness. So I did a BNP and it came back at 5,000. Now, in Tauranga, you'll notice that BNP 32, anything more than 400, heart failure is likely. <laughs> yeah. So BNP are the B-type natriuretic peptides, which are released by the ventricles in response to ventricular pressure. So once you start getting overloaded with fluid, your BNP is going to go up. So it's really handy for the person whose main problem is shortness of breath and they've smoked all their life. Sometimes you, you know, you do everything and they're still short of breath and you think, oh, well, is it your heart or is it your lungs? Um, so in New Zealand, we have these two different kinds. Um, in Tauranga, we tend to use the BNP32. I think it's the cheaper one. It's the quicker one. The NT Pro BNP gets sent to Christchurch. They are about $75 a pop. But if I'm going to see a patient three weekly and give them medications, then it's probably better than I'm treating the right thing. Um, the one new limitation we've got around BNP is that Entresto, the new heart failure drug, works on the necrolysin side. And so when you first start Entresto, it's probably just for the first six weeks, you can actually get an increase in the basic BNP. Um, and then after that, it should come down. And of course, if they've got flash pulmonary edema also. So once you get your patient well controlled, their BNP should be less than 400 or with the ENT less than 100. But it's when they're getting overloaded that it soars up. So it's a really handy roll in, roll out kind of test. Okay, so back to the patient, because we've got to get their head around it. 
And they need to know right from the start that this is a condition forever and that we can get it under control, but given that same set of circumstances, it will rear its head again. So they need to be on medications forever. And I talk about that from the first meeting. There have been a couple of studies done in the last few years that showed that people whose heart failure recover, i.e. EF back to over 50%, if they stop their meds, about 50% are dead in the first year. So with those kind of odds, I want my patients to stay on the medications. <clears throat> and I like them to feel, in, to feel in control. So I always give them a furizomide or bumetamide titration plan so that they can work um, for their symptoms. And I also tell them to how to wangle it a bit. So if you're out in the morning, have it in the afternoon, etc. <clears throat> we know that patients that recognize the symptoms and put two and two together, stay away from hospital and GPs because they can manage themselves at home. So we talk about weighing themselves daily. And if you've got this wonderful book here, um, I always turn the page down and it talks about the things they should do each day, which is weighing themselves and checking for swelling and checking their breathing. And in the back, there's a place to write it down because I want them to notice when things change. I always, it's really hard for people that have been trying to lose weight all their life. They don't like to measure their weight. So I have to reassure them I'm not interested in how much you weigh, I'm interested in the change because I don't want you getting overloaded. I say to avoid extra salt and we talk about a sensible fluid intake. It's interesting, there's actually not good research um, you know, showing the benefit of restricting fluids, but it stands to reason that it's sensible to have about one and a half litres a day. More and it's just more workload on the heart. If they are overweight, then to lose weight means less body to pump around. Alcohol is a toxin, and um, it's a bit like tachycardias. If people quit alcohol, then their heart recovers really well. Of course, stop smoking and get active, but rest if you need it. So those are all the kinds of things I talk about with them. And this little booklet is really good, Staying Well with Heart Failure which are all available free from the Heart Foundation. You can get 25 copies for free per month. So fluid management. The patient needs to understand why fluid builds up. That's a sign that their heart's struggling. And so we want to notice that fast so we can help them stay well. If you come to hospital and lie in bed, you lose about 20% of your muscle tone in a week. So you're going to feel more tired when you go home. So it's better to stay at home and play with the grandkids. So I want them to recognize their symptoms. And my plan for them is if there's an increase in two symptoms, then to increase the diuretic. And I would usually write that on the back page of this book. So it's got a little plan here and it says if weight is increased, well, I cross that out. I say if there's an increase in two symptoms. So if they're on 80 milligrams of furosemide a day, I would get them to have an extra 40 for two to three days. If they're on one furosemide, then I get them to have half. Today I had a chap who is no longer on furosemide, so I gave him a bottle just to take a half if and when he needs it. So they need to have that plan. We need to know um, how much they need. I always talk with them about less furosemide is best. All their other meds I want on high doses. Furosemide and bumetanide actually put the wrong process in place. So less is best, but you, you use less overall if you get on and, and treat any overload fast. Um, there is some thought that bumetanide might be useful in abdominal edema. I don't find it much different to furosemide. Some people respond better to one than the other. Um, some people find that if they lie in bed for half an hour after taking their furosemide, then it's more active. Some people find if they're on three furosemide a day, that if they take it all at morning, it works well. Others prefer the two in the morning and one in the lunchtime. I've got a 
patient who works on the roads, so he takes his too when he gets home after work at night because he can't find toilets out on the road work. So, so it's working it around them and finding how their body responds because all bodies respond differently. I think I used to use a lot more furosemide when I first started. Now I don't use as much and I try and get the other tablets up faster. Um, furosemide also comes in a 500 milligram tablet. So I have a couple patients who are stable on 500 mane and 250 midday. I have thought about reducing them, but um, one of them in particular, I mean, he was palliative 18 months ago and he's still doing really well and he cares for his wife. So I'm not going to make any alterations because he's okay as he is. For people where we are increasing the furosemide up and up and you know you get up to five or even three and four and it's not making that difference, then to add half a bendrofluoroside can be quite handy. But gosh, I've seen the renal function go off really bad, <laughs> really fast. So I don't ever track, test the renal function the next day. I'd always leave it about four days so the body can recover again. Um, and so I, I would only ever dispense, you know, about 10 tablets at a time or metolazone five tablets. It's section 29. Oh, it used to be section 29. Only ever 2.5. And it's just as an extra. For some people, they might, um, I've got a couple patients who take it once a week, only on a Sunday, and that just keeps them in check for the rest of the week. Um, for some people that are palliative, we might need to give it two or three days in a row before we see the change. So it's pretty much try and see, but watch the renal function because it um, can be really effective. So why do we care about fluids? Well, when they're overloaded, they can't breathe. If they get onto it fast, then they get better faster. And so they don't get overloaded and end up in the GP and end up at hospital. Also, hey, it's really good to have control over your own problems. And so they can, um, you know, know how to make, keep themselves well. So I think that's a really important thing. If, if I had a chronic illness, I would like to be able to feel I had some control over it and some understanding of how to manage myself with it. Right, so medical treatment. Well, I refer to them as the holy trinity, the ACEs, the beta blockers, and the MRAs. So with the ACEs, we've got the... Um, you know, your good old fashioned ACEs, and I'll break them all down soon. But we've got, we traditionally start with the ACE, and if people get that dreaded ACE cough, then we'll try them on an ARB. Why don't we go straight to the ARB? Well, there's some evidence that that very thing that causes the cough also shows that actually the ACE works in a different way and so it's even more beneficial than the ARBs but there's new research that shows that ARBs are quite good also so uh, there's probably still a bit more research benefiting the ACEs and now we have the ARNIs the angiotensin receptor necrolysin inhibitors which is the Entresto so to get the special authority for this, people have to have been on um, guideline treatment and still have symptoms of more than an NYH, NYHA class two. So that means they're hanging around the back of the basketball court um, and an EF less than 35%. So that's most of my patients. And certainly I'm seeing some good results with it. Um, they're now doing some studies into seeing if it actually improves LV function. Compared to enalapril of 20 milligrams BD, it's shown to reduce morbidity and mortality by about 20%. And that's all cause mortality and improved quality of life. So certainly when we first started using it a couple of years ago, I did a really good sell on it with patients and talked all about it. And and they would uh, be really keen to switch over. And most people 
find it really good. It um, also has a little bit of a diuretic effect and people often feel like they're a bit clearer through the chest. Um, however, it's a neurohormonal and so like spironolactone, some people just feel lousy on it. I've got a few patients that I have stopped on it because they just lay down and wanted to die. Um, they just didn't feel great on it. So that's one of those odd ones. Beta blockers have been a go-to for years and years. Um, and the, the MRAs, so we used to call them aldosterone antagonists. So that's your spironolactone. And that's for if the NYHA is class two and above. And of course, now this year, we've got our SGLT2 inhibitors with the Jardians. Um, and I expect that in the ESC guidelines released later this month from Europe, that we'll see that Jardians or Embertiflozin is in there. Um, because there's a 25% reduction, which is great. I mean, that puts it up with the beta blockers and the ARNIs. So... In the, in the MRAs. So they all have quite an amazing um, reduction in risk. So how do we start them? Well, if they're congested, we would normally start with an ACE and then soon add an MRA. So that's spiro. And of course, all of those are potassium sparing, aren't they? So we're always wanting to check the kidneys. Um, and we might have to put furosemide in there. Not everyone with heart failure needs furosemide. So just because someone doesn't have furosemide on their um, script, you know, doesn't mean they don't have heart failure. Um, so we would we would go in that order, and once they are euvolemic, then we'd add the beta blocker. Jardiance I wrote in there at the side because where does it come in? Well, it depends what their diabetes is up to. <laughs> um, and for Jardiance, we would just use 10 milligrams, whereas for diabetes control, we would move up to 25 milligrams. Um, and then after they've been on those medications, we would have them on there for three months and then we would look at re-echoing because it takes about three months for turnaround of um, heart repair. And for me, who is dealing with the sickest of the sick when they're just out of hospital, sometimes with those really sick ones, I can't move any medications for the first month because their body's just not up to it. Their systolic blood pressure is still 86. You know, their um, heart rates 70 on a good day and, and they're still pale and clammy so we just have to watch and wait and have them on the tiny doses and know that the body is designed to heal when it's given the chance to so to keep all the little things taken care of like having a sensible fluid intake and getting rest and eating well and giving up alcohol and doing all those things so that they can help themselves recover until they've recovered well enough that we can start using these meds in a way that will help them. So this is from the, um, using the NZ formulary. And in heart failure, we're always aiming for the highest doses. We start little. And of course, that's a concern for a patient. They said, hi, oh, you're increasing them again. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, I'd love you to be on metoprolol 190, but if we'd started you on that, you would have felt like you're being flattened by a logging truck. You know, so we start you on these little doses and creep them up so you feel well all the time. So it does mean a lot more trips to see us or you, um, but that's the way to keep them feeling well. So with beta blockers, we aim for a heart rate between 60 and 70. Why? It's because when our heart's pumping, yeah, that's good, but it's when it's in relaxed mode that it feeds the myocardium. So if you're going at 90, there's little feeding happening. If you can slow it down to 60 to 70, then you're going to get more opportunity for feeding that myocardium. So that's a good reason. Of course, if someone has tachycardia-induced heart failure, then, yeah, this is going to be the first thing you move on, and, and you are going to 
increase it as soon as you can. With beta blockers, it never pays to stop suddenly because you can get that rebound tachycardia, um, which is particularly a concern if they have an ICD in place. With um, CRT pacing, which I'll talk about later, we want people on the biggest possible doses because we want to drive that pacemaker to do all the work and not their heart. And once we've got that pacing in place, then we can give them huge doses and they're going to get the benefit of those big doses, but still we can keep the heart rate in control by pacing them. So yes, in my world, we aim for Bisoprolol 10, and I love Bisoprolol because it's a lot more cardio-specific than Metoprolol um, and less crazy dreams and all that kind of thing, um, and Metoprolol 190. Carvedilol I find really difficult to use because it also has some alpha blocker in it, so it drops blood pressure. So it's great for the few hypertensive patients that we get with bad heart failure. Uh, they're a rarity, really. Um, but when you have one of them, then the carvedilol comes into its own. Um, they all have idiosyncrasies. It used to be thought that you couldn't use uh, beta blockers and people with any respiratory disease. Well, COPD, if you treat their heart failure with beta blockers, they're going to feel better all around. The trouble is if people um, have asthma and if on their spir spirometry, if it shows a significant response to Ventolin, more than 70%, that's when you go really cautious with these and we might not use them. The MRAs, the spinal actin, um, interesting, the NZ formulary say up to 50 milligrams. I would never use that. Sometimes with uh, liver problems, we might go up to 100, but if you want to see people's kidney function go off, start them on Spiro. <laughs> You know, and you should be checking their renal function after a week and after three weeks. And of course, one of the problems with them is gynecomastia. And interesting, today I have had two patients with gynecomastia. So when you look at the adverse re reactions, um, spironolactone, gynecomastia is about, oh, so gynecomastia is guys with moves, sore boobs tender nipples and all the works. And a couple of years ago, I had two patients have mammograms. It was like, no, <laughs> stop the spiral act, don't you? Don't need a memo. So um, one of my patients this morning, I stopped his spiro back in May and put him on a plerinone. The plerinone gynecomastia isn't quite so um, uh, prominent. Uh, but he's still, this morning he said he pulled his blankets up and his fingernail touched his nipple and it brought tears to his eyes. It's like, oh, okay. And one this afternoon could feel some lumps in his chest. So I've stopped the spinal lactone on him. And it might take a few months. Hopefully they all go away, but they can cause benign tumor, tumors, which we don't want. More often it's just the tenderness. But um, yeah, so I've stopped the other one, Spiro, and I've actually given him a couple of weeks before he starts the plerinone just to see if we can get rid of all that kind of effect. The SGLT2 inhibitors with the Jardiance, how they work is by making people pee out all the sugars. So they're going to be weeing more. So that means we need to pull back the frusamide a little when we first start them. And of course, check the U's and E's afterwards. Oh, and there's your special authority form for Jardiance, which I'm sure we're all getting familiar with. And ACEs, well, so is going out, and perindopril, ah, it keeps coming up with people saying it needs to be done AC. Well, that might just be the kind that we've got in the country at the moment. So hence, I'm tending to use lisinopril because it's a daily one, and you start on 2.5 and move it up to 20 milligrams. Um, and quinopril and enalapril are both BD medications. So ACEs are good. And of course, if they have the cough, then go on to the ARBs. And losartan is really handy at lowering uric acid. If they're on these ACEs and they still have um, ongoing symptoms, then we can swap them to an ARNI. You always have to have the washout period of 36 hours. Uh, post stopping the ACE or 24 hours post ARB. 
Um, they also have that diuretic effect, so I would also cut the furosemide back and check the renal in a week. I up titrate every two, three weeks. So every two, every three weeks, the patients usually come back to me and I move the meds up again. So that's the kind of process we're going at. The other things is um, the joxin is only if AF is not rate controlled and always stop the calcium channel. They're negative inotropes. So that makes it harder for the heart to work. So if they're on diltiazem for angina, let's give them duride. If they're on diltiazem for um, you know, tachycardias, well, we're going to up the beta blocker. And also uh, treat the uric acid because there is some impact of that on heart failure. So looking at the bigger picture. Okay, if we do all of that and at three months they still have the pump function that's down, then particularly if they're there because of ischemic problems, then we know that they are at increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So if you die of heart failure, there's usually two ways of doing it. One is the slow death over months and months where you get cachexic and waste away. Yeah. And the other is the fast death where you're having your morning tea and then you're gone. So for people where the fast death is going to be risky, then we look at putting an ICD in. Now, often people forget about the C part of it, the cardioverter, so they're implantable cardioverter defibrillators. How we work them is that if the person comes in with a rate at 160 beats a minute, then we'll have programmed the ICD to override that and it will come in and beat it at 170 beats a minute for a dozen beats or so and then it will stop. And it will try that half a dozen times and that's the cardioversion and sometimes just doing that is enough for it to get control again and you go back into normal sinus rhythm. And that doesn't use much battery and the patient is no more aware of that than they would be of a fast heart rhythm. So they might just feel some heaviness in the chest. Because if that doesn't work after a few times, then it will charge and it will fire. And the problem is then we say no driving for six months, etc., etc. So the cardioversion is a good part for it to be. Um, CRTs are what we're using more and more, though there is some thought that with the Arnies we'll need less of them. So when you get a, a left bundle branch block, like in that little ECG there, that wide QRS means it's taking time for the electrical impulse to go around the ventricles. And it, you start getting this sloshy heart. A heart that pumps like this is going to be strong because it's beating together. These are the ventricles. If it's sloshing like this, it loses power and over time it just becomes more so. So we see that QRS getting broader and broader. In New Zealand, we need to have a QRS more than 150 milliseconds before we look at putting CRTs in. In Aussie, it's down to 130. So they're very similar to an ICD. You have a lead in your RV and your lead in your RA. But then to get the left side to pump at the same time, they have to find the coronary sinus, which is up in the right atria, feed it round the back of the heart on a vein, and then sit it on top of the left ventricle so that the left ventricle and the right ventricle can pace together. And um, it's shown to improve NYHA. So they feel better and it should also improve LV function. Um, some of my patients have felt better within a few weeks of getting this and others haven't noticed any different. Is it expensive? And yes. So CRTDs are probably about 35 grand. So I have a patient at the moment where we'd like to put an ICD in him. He's a youngish chap, um, but he's, an, well, he's not an immigrant. He's here on a work visa and his, um, rent, his EF is still about 25%. He works a manual job. But if, if he doesn't get his work visa extended and he goes back to the country he comes from, they couldn't look after this there. So we're not putting one in him because it might be harmful for him. So they're not always the best thing. 
you know, if you go to a Pacific Island, they don't know how to work these. If you go to Europe or America, you need to buy your insurance before your plane ticket. I've had one patient come back from America with a $250,000 bill for cardiology. So these are very expensive devices because all the technical background for them. With these, we want people pacing at least 96% of the time. So that means we want the beta blockers up really high. So it's this that can pace to get those LV and RV pumping better again. If someone has got into heart failure because of a tachycardia or fast AF, then we might look at ablating them. Ablations are quite hard to get in New Zealand compared to overseas. You have to have heart failure caused by it, basically. There are two ways of doing ablation. The one on the right shows the little dip, 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 where you join the dots and they just burn all around them because we know that most AF comes from the pulmonary veins. So they have to join the dots all around the pulmonary veins to stop the impulses coming. Or you can use the cryotherapy balloon that goes into the pulmonary vein they expand it, they freeze it, so there's a scar rim around it, and that stops the AF coming out. And um, ablation effective about 70% of the time, the 30% it's not effective for, will still have less AF overall um, and better control, but they might need further ablation. So there's always going to be oops times, times when you look at the patient and go, you know, why didn't you increase the furosemide? Yeah, it's all a learning process for them. And sometimes they don't want to accept that anything's the matter with them. It really is good uh, when they have some oopsies early on, so they get interested in looking after themselves. And it's really important to keep all your information basic so it can relate to the patient. I find these really good, and this is the heart failure checkbook that it's just all graph for them documenting it. Um, the guidelines, the New Zealand Australia guidelines were out in 2018. Um, the Heart Foundation also has a heart help uh, email that if people go on the website and enroll with heart help, then they get an email, it's about every six weeks. So they don't plague their inboxes and it's just of nice reminders of how to look after your heart and some recipes. There's also about 70 um, patient videos in there. So if people are feeling alone, they can look and see how someone else is coping with heart failure. And for the rural areas, they might want to call a heart help nurse that the Heart Foundation also have, just for some other information. So that's me. Have you any questions? <laughs> any questions? Oh, thank you very much, Rachel. Oh, yes, we've got questions. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> I'll just find out. So here we go. So first off, we have, I find assessment of JVP particularly subjective. Any yeah. suggestions, please? Um, I think a good patient history is just as good as a JVP. Um, you know, I can't always see JVPs and I'll sometimes look at when doctors say they can see a JVP and I think, really? If someone's really overloaded, it's really easy to see. But if they're not overloaded, you can be wondering. So, yeah, practice it, but um, get the patient assessment and listen to how they're actually doing and how, how easily they're puffing and all those other kind of things. You know, JVP is not the be all and end all, it's the whole picture that's important. But it also, if you have lighting coming from this angle, so it depends how your clinic room is set up. Our current clinic rooms are, are much harder, the light comes from that angle instead and it hides them. Okay, would you use empagliflozone if not diabetic, pre diabetic? No. No, their HbA1c has to be over 53 with being on metformin. And we have here, I've just got the thing, here we go. So BMP can underread an obese patients. 
what would yeah. you like to, would you like to make comment about this also it's been said not to use bmp for monitoring heart failure improvement or worsening and just wondering what your opinion is on this please yes so when bmps came out christchurch did a lot of research around that and there was a lot of talk about using bmp guided um well, why? Because I can see the patient, they're sitting in front of me, they tell me that they can walk, their 15 minute walk only takes them 12 minutes now. You know, I can see the improvement like that. They haven't got the puffiness anymore, they're down to two pillows instead of four. So you don't really need to be doing a blood test all the time. Most patients don't like having blood tests. Why haven't pay an extra $75 all the time? So I only use it as a roll in, roll out when I am confused. I have the benefit of having echoes. And even with an echo, if I'm unsure about a person because I know they have COPD, you know, and that's when it becomes hard to judge sometimes, or they might have something else going on that hasn't presented yet. And late, you know, six months later it does, but in that time before it becomes the big nasty you're wondering what's going on. That's the time when a BNP is useful. I, I, I use the person rather than the numbers to gauge my treatment. Yeah. Um, I guess that's where blood pressure also comes in. Do I increase ACEs when, with a blood pressure of 96? <laughs> well, I have been known to if they're asymptomatic. Usually I like systolics over 100, but... Um, if they're 102, yes, I'll bump up the ACE, but I might pull the frusamide back a little bit. And ACEs, um, some ACEs are better uh, used by the body in the second half of the REM cycle. That was research from a couple of years ago. So therefore, if they have them at night, they just have to get up slowly if they need a wee. Um, and they might be a bit more dizzy the first couple of days so I tell them to expect that but I tell them that the only reason I'm doing it is to try and improve your heart so let's make a go of it if it doesn't work go back to the previous dose but then in four or five days time try that increased dose again just in case it wasn't some other reason that you were getting dizzy because we know that the best turnaround in heart function is with those higher doses and what's the best turnaround I've seen well um, an AF that's gone from 16% EF to 64% EF. You know, so that's the kind of changes that we're looking for. And that's why we want the big doses. Thank you. And then someone's just asking, is the Pleironone funded? Yes, it is. Um, you just have to fill in one easy form on special authority and it comes back with a lifetime. Thing. And they just have to have reacted negatively to spinal lactone. Well, most, a lot of people can fill that one in. And this is more of a comment than anything, but just to say, I, I have a new patient who has Graves' thyrotoxicosis induced atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathy, severe congestive heart failure, and had an ICD placed in Australia. He had about 30 shocks in a few days post-hospital discharge every time he went into atrial fibrillation and demanded it be switched off. Mm. Yeah. So it depends what I, kind of ICD. So CRTs are no good in AF because you're not going to get that pump function. Um, I see, you know, ICDs are not the be-all and end-all. They can have broken wires um, and they can have... Uh, you know, we can have some, what do you call it, when you have the whole lot of shocks, uh, a storm, um, and often that's a VT coming through. If it was an atrial tachycardia, then hopefully they could do something about that on increasing the medication. They could slow that down so they didn't get the shock. Overseas, they do, particularly in America, they put in ICDs a lot more uh, carefree than we do um, so not everyone has them with the biggest need for them but yes often I would I would go the um, drug control first before wanting to switch it off we have switched it off in a couple of patients that don't want it anymore and that's the other thing with ICDs is we do like to switch it off near end of life and how and patients always think I'm 
hitting their off switch when I suggest it. It's hated that conversation. But most people actually don't use the defibrillator part of their ICD. And so when it comes up to battery change, we might have a conversation with them that, you know, you've had this in for eight years, your battery needs to be changed. You haven't had any shocks for the last four years. You know, you have this cancer of your lung that's getting worse. Um, you know, shall we just leave the current battery in there and let it run its course and let you die a natural death? Because no one wants to see a person getting a shock as their body is trying to die. And it will carry on and carry on and try and give you lots of shocks to try and restore you to life. So if your body's worn out and ready to go, then we often suggest turning it off or not replacing the battery. Thank you. And then someone's asking about the risk of exercise. I have a gym junkie with an ejection fraction of 36% who oh. loves to wet lift weights. Oh. Just comment. <laughs> so the exercise we don't want them doing is that mm, the grunt move, the weightlifting move. <laughs> And I, earlier this year, I had several gym junkies, you know, ex-SAS and, you know, really, really fit people. And their whole ego, their whole persona has been tied up in performance. And that is really hard. So I refer most of them to the psychologist <laughs> because otherwise they can't get past it. We don't want them over-exercising. Over-exercise, you develop right heart failure. You're more likely to develop heart blocks, all kinds of things. But essentially, if the basic person was cardiomyopathy, I want you to go for a walk fast enough that you have to puff a bit to talk. It's that walk and talk test. And I don't want you doing the, mm, the grunting move because that's how we change vagal tone, isn't it? That's how we do if they've got an SBT. We tell them to go... Mm, because you're going to change that vagal tone there. So um, yeah, the grunt moves we try and do less of, but you might need a psychologist's help. Oh, thank you very much, Rachel. That's us got through the questions. You've survived and you've done a beautiful job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. People are very grateful for the time you've given us this evening and the degree of information found you very informative and have loved your talk. You've had a range of people join you from radiologists to doctors to nurse practitioners and um, yeah you've had a whole spectrum of people log in this evening to hear your talk and hear what you've got to say so thank you very much for taking your time out this evening to join us yeah. much appreciated thank you